Inculturation means the incarnation of the gospel in autonomous cultures and at the same time the introduction of those cultures into the life of the church. You have a model of not two cultures, the binarism went out there, but they become part of our culture but we change. Hmm. You can relate it to those Brazilian theories of cannibalism if you like, but I don't think John Paul really wanted to do that. But it's an interesting idea because that is where translation starts to be re-theorized within the Vatican tradition. Through enculturation, the church makes the gospel incarnate in different cultures and at the same time introduces people. Same two-way movement. We will change them, but they will change us. The dialectic. And no innocence. We're not going to respect their primacy, but nor do we claim to remain intact out of this process. It's a two-way street. And translation is operating there, as you'll see here. Part of the text actually sets about, therefore, rewriting the Vatican's own history in these terms, pointing out that the current Vatican Catholic culture uh, did not fall from heaven, but developed through processes of enculturation, which we might also see as uh, involving translation. As you can see there, you started off with the people of Israel. It took from neighboring peoples forms of worship, the encounter between the Jewish world and Greek wisdom, and so on, a constant enrichment of the scriptures through encounters and cultural encounters, which has no reason to stop. And they're very aware that in this encounter, it's, it's, a, it's history, it's historical. I'm moving on in the text. The work of enculturation, it is I-N, not E-N, enculturation, of which the translation into the vernacular languages is a part. Okay, so you start to theorize translation in terms of this wider cultural process. But here, in 2001, in notorious Liturgium Authenticum, the true liturgy, the, the real one, uh, here we start to move to the more conservative positions. It is not an avenue for the creation of new varieties or families of rights. It says, wait a minute, this two-way street which, uh, risks creating lots of different things happening in lots of different churches, in lots of different languages, and we can't control that. It's a bit like that logic is going to lead to the overthrow of, well, the Vatican. Uh, uh, on the contrary, it should be recognized that any adaptations introduced out of cultural or pastoral necessity thereby become part of the Roman rite and are to be inserted into it in a harmonious way. So you do still have lip service at least to that two-way street, but they become part of the Roman rite. And part of this is also insisting that all translations be from the Latin text as established. Now, this is the text you work for. Don't go back to any other languages. Don't mess around with other interpretations. We have sorted it out. This is the liturgy. It's not the Bible, OK? But the, the thinking carries through. Um, I, I find this an interesting problem. I, I, I find the problem. The concept of enculturation, which can be taken and manipulated in order for the current Vatican to impose its values on the entire church or attempt to, but it can also be taken as, as an interesting and intriguing way of writing the history of the institution and recognizing itself as being open to influences and, and constantly engaged in these influences through translation. And much as my political preferences might be at one end of the spectrum, I find it intriguing and useful to have a concept that can enable us to talk about this process to other people who have other positions in that spectrum. Something like this might help the debate about the Arizona legislature. They started to think, what is our culture? 
you know, was, you know, did we come to Arizona and it was virgin territory? And yeah, no. Now, enculturation as a model can be used almost anywhere if you look around us. Valerie was asked, the question you were asked was, when, you, when they got to Japan and they started to translate, how did they know it was literature? You know, you talked about the problems of different genres that didn't map, but how is it that the very institution or fact of having a part of life that is literature was somehow common? And it may have been, there may have been something there. But the growth of the belief in an institution called literature can very easily be seen as a fact of enculturation. It starts someplace, it incorporates others, it extends, it becomes something else. The history of comparative literature, such as it is, is a history of enculturation. In a very productive, self-transforming sense, perhaps quite the opposite of what the history of recent translation in the Catholic Church might be. But, for that matter, the growth of capitalism is also enculturation, surely. Capitalism changes as it grows. We, we're here to talk about globalization. Do you think that the computer programs we use, the interaction we're having all over the world with these little machines, do you think it's just one model imposed on the rest? It's not. If you follow the history of localization, you realize that the fact of spreading out into many languages and situations changes the technologies themselves. There is a two-way movement, although there's less of the feedback than in other kinds of enculturation. Democracy. When Habermas talks about modernity, he means the liberal humanism that underlies the liberal democratic state. It has spread out and has changed its form. Uh, through globalization, of course, but it can be thought of in those terms. I'm amazed, no matter where I am in the world, I tend to be asked to speak at a university, and I go into the building, and they're all universities. How is that? How is it that, that universities, they have departments and faculties, and they have ranks that are similar? It wasn't always like that. I know the European university began the earliest, I think, is Bologna. But in Spain, it was modeled on the Islamic um, madras, madrasas. Okay? It was taken over, the college, colegio, was taken over from Islamic culture, modified, became a university in Italy, and spread out, and it spread out all over the world, and changed as a result of it. But are we somehow not in enculturation, in the very place we're speaking in, and the way we're speaking? And for that matter, the values that do concern me, the Habermasian values of liberal humanism, have also spread and be changed. Those values, interestingly enough, uh, the phrase I like, I do like from Habermas, is that the ideal democratic state is one where people feel they are responsible for their laws, or feel that they are responsible for the interpretation of their rights in a different formulation. It requires not just understanding of what's happening, but a feeling of involvement in it. It requires communication in a far wider sense. And when I see, as we've seen last year, but continuing now, the uprisings in the Arabic-speaking world, and you wonder, how did those ideas get there? We don't know where it's heading. It may be heading in one direction or another. How did those ideas get there? How do you follow it through? It's obvious to anybody. It's not just Twitter and Facebook. It's a, a very deep aspiration to ideals that come from beyond and to become part of a wider thing, at least for those on the liberal humanist side of that, that perspective. That this enculturation, which may be unsuccessful, may be manipulated, you know, my fellow academics, I mean, it's, it's the CIA, it's the State Department, it's spies infiltrating, it's not real. Perhaps, I don't know, perhaps that's part of it. But on the other hand, there were very real people taking very real political stances in the name of something wider than their immediate culture. And I found it very interesting to look at that as enculturation. 
I find it intriguing myself to look at enculturation not only as something that we are involved in and I'm in the middle of because I'm in a university and I have certain political beliefs and I have certain views of translation and literature, etc. But also, but also with our innocence, we are involved in it. If somebody in London or Massachusetts says, go out into the world and collect me all these different ideas of translation, and we go out and do that, what are we doing? Extending translation studies? Yes. Changing the nature of translation studies? Yes. But bringing others into a common culture? Also. Where is the power? Well, you figure that out. Uh, the, the term empowerment is rather ambiguous, depending on who uses it and, who, and whose interest. But we're in it, and there is no innocence. No retreat to meta-language. I love this quote. It's 68. It's, it's Henri Lefebvre, not André, Henri. Uh, big. When I met him, he was a very old Marxist, strong Marxist, still a believer. Still a believer. Meta language, it's the great alibi for covering over and forgetting the historical tasks and the missions that have not been accomplished, for rubbing out, effacing responsibilities, for spreading a latent guilt, an imprecise feeling of frustration and unease. The retreat to meta language, my fellow intellectuals who get back, we're not involved. We are critical. We do critical analysis. We can look at the language and analyze it. We can pin names on the narratives. No, it's an alibi for not recognizing that you're in it. You're in that process of enculturation as wider translation. In terms of technical translation studies, I'm starting to move. I mean, just lately, the, 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 the burning question has been who translates, who are translators, and I find that very interesting um, to bring out the hidden sides of translation history. But I'm starting to move in my own mind to the very forgotten question of what gets translated. It does matter what we are moving, because that matter, that ideological content, tends to configure the purposes of the transfer the people involved and the mode of transfer. Rub out the term transfer. I swore to myself never to use it again, but <laughs> communicative acts. Okay, the what is largely forgotten. For example, statistics that count the number of books translated do tell us something, but they're not telling us the most vital aspect of what it is that's moving and thereby why it is moving. And thereby, if you look at it on a big scale, what's happening to the cultures involved. I move to a, an attempt to win hearts and minds. You can see that, seen from this perspective, translation is not just a narrow act, but it's still there. That the purpose of translation may be to extend and defend and alter the configuration of cultures. To win hearts and minds. The phrase hearts and minds is well known to the American public as being repeated in this policy. This is how the United States is still hoping to win hearts and minds in Afghanistan. They use the term. It's used three times in this document. Not referred to where it came from, but still. Counterinsurgency. It's one word, apparently. Anyway. Counterinsurgency is an amazing document. It is intelligent. Sorry, I rephrase that. <laughs> there are at least four intelligent parts in it, all written by different people who are smart. You know, the, the Americans have very good institutions and can solve a problem. Trouble is, they put four contradictory solutions into this book, and they're trying to work it out. The first big smart section is, they, they figured out, to do counterinsurgency, we have to know what insurgency is. Who's the best theorist around of insurgency? You've got this, all these pages from Mao Tung, you know. You've got, and Mao knows, you know, to, to resist, and, and you have to enter the villages and win the heart. He didn't use hearts and minds, but the feeling is there. You get the people on your side. And they learned this lesson. The amazing thing is, 
once you learn that lesson, there's no difference between insurgency and counterinsurgency. It's all the one struggle for the hearts and minds. Okay, so they're trying to learn the lessons of Chinese communism in one part to influence the common people. But they might also have looked at where hearts and minds comes from, as many of you know. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, oh, you can do your own translation, but shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. That's where it comes from. I'm interested that that keep is a military term. It's to take, occupy, and defend, like the strategy in Afghanistan. Uh, what I'm really interested there is this, which passes all understanding. Uh, Paul, as, as you're aware, has this inspirational view that the hearts and minds are not going to come from reason alone. It's going to come from an emotional engagement. And that's the lesson that the counterinsurgency manual does not learn. Here's why. Once the unit settles into the area of operation, how am I going for time? I, I, this is rather long and I might reduce it. Yeah, we'll go fast. You can, it's online, everybody can read it. It's not secret information, hey? Okay. Its next task is to build trusted networks. My underline, my italic, okay? This is the true meaning. I love this is exe exegetical text. This is the true meaning of the phrase hearts and minds. They don't cite Paul, but well, <laughs> there it is. Trusted networks, that's what translators do. Hey, come on, that's, we're, we're good on trust, aren't we? which comprises two separate components. Good. Yeah. Hearts means persuading people that their best interests are served by counterinsurgency success. What? Minds means convincing them that the force can protect them and that resisting is pointless. So <laughs> mind sees... <laughs> your mind sees, we are so big. We got these big bombs and these big planes, you know. Minds means be scared, right? But hearts, hearts, <laughs> wait a minute, it, 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 it fits into neoclassical negotiation theory where people sort out their interests, unequal partners, and perceive and pursue um, mutual benefits. You know, there is a very good neoclassical theory behind this phrase, best interests. You know, that in this engagement between you and us, I can gain and you can gain, even though we're radically unequal. It's a beautiful theory of cooperation. It's embedded there, but it has nothing to do with hearts, I think. Unless Americans have their hearts somewhere else in the body or in their emotions, anyway. Calculated self-interest, not emotion, is what counts. This is The Economist writing, okay? You present it to them rationally, and they'll figure out what to do and what's in their best interest, and they'll be on your side. Okay? Once successful uh, trusted networks grow like roots in the populace, they displace enemy networks. Okay? Uh, so we're going to win hearts and minds through applying reason. Calculated self-interest, not emotion. So, of course, when you go around burning the Quran and getting a soldier go haywire and shoot up anybody, uh, that calculated self-interest is rather hard to maintain. Here's another really intelligent part of the document. Cultural knowledge is essential. You know, you've, you've done the economics, you've done the self-interest, you've, you've done the showing how big you are, but cultural knowledge, and look at this. Members of other societies often have different notions of rationality. Wait a minute, in the previous page, you just presented superb capitalist rationality, the, the, the neoclassical negotiation theory and the self-interests. And over here on this page, you realize that it's not gonna work because there's a different sense of rationality operative there. 
So the person who wrote that part of the document didn't speak with the person who wrote that part of the document, but they're both very good. What may appear abnormal or strange to an external observer may appear self, etc. Okay, you can read that. Good passage. Insurgents hold a distinct... Here is where they actually theorise why they're going to fail. Huh? Hold a distinct advantage. They speak the language. I mean, having done the theory, the cultural bit, having realised that we're engaged in inculturation, and this is not an easy thing, they come to the language. And language is not mentioned very often. I think it's six times in the document. We'll see some of them later. And it says, language and cultural understanding. A greater emphasis on language and cultural understanding as part of warfare. As part of warfare. It's very lucid. They can realise what they need. The authors must realise why they're failing. And you have a power, uh, sorry, a, a section that that gives us what the components are of this six sociocult. It's like a textbook in translation, isn't it? You know, you could pick up bits of that and use it in your translation class. When dealing with the home nation. Experience in the home nation language, the ability to learn languages or support reliable translators. Okay, this is when you start to get into the need for translators. And just one final thing before I get on to the, the linguists involved. This is really smart. They, they, they realize that the key to their winning hearts and minds could be the women. This is well before, you know. They didn't read Aristophanes, but they might have. The women, and therefore you send in women soldiers. Now that is really clever. They've thought about it. They've realized there are things they can do that are creative. What that very beautiful passage doesn't do, though, is explain how the woman soldier is going to talk with the Afghan woman. As if language had suddenly become transparent and uh, female empathy will win through. Because, as far as I've seen, all the interpreters are men. Oh, this is going to go so long. I'm going to have to go fast, OK? The problem is that um, they divide the linguists up into the interpreters recruited on the ground, whom they will not trust, and then the uh, US-born linguists, who do not learn the language well. And, and, and these latter people are supposed to control the other people, and they can't because they haven't got enough language skills. Why don't they have enough language skills? Because they learn like that. And Sorry, that's, I'm trying to find a man who's beautiful as well. This is from The Sleeping Dictionary. If you've seen that film, Jessica Alba will teach you any language you want. Okay, good, let's go. 